How many of you have ever had an experience that took your breath away? Thank you. I have. I had the unfortunate experience of losing my little brother. And at the time, I didn't know the impact it would have on me. And I didn't lose my brother in the way most people would think about. Mm -mm. But I think it's a way that a lot of people here might be able to relate to. I lost my brother to the prison system. When my brother was incarcerated, I was outcarcerated. I was serving the sentence with him, but the only difference was I was serving the sentence on the outside. And I forgot my clicker, so. Yeah. Thank you. Or else you have to stare at this the whole time. That's me in my moment. <laughs> my brother was charged with a heinous crime that I could not believe. I thought, this is crazy, not my brother. I mean, look at us. This is somebody I've known my whole life. If he had done something, I would have known. But as I learned more about the charges, I began to question things and began to look at people differently. I thought, what could be going on in their lives? Something I never thought about before. I didn't know about my capacity for compassion. In fact, it was just the opposite. In my family, we didn't talk about things. We kept to ourselves. What was going on in somebody else's family was none of our business. And what was going on in our family was none of their business. So when my brother was arrested in January of 1997, I didn't talk about it. I didn't tell anyone. He was able to turn himself in, and a couple hours later I could bail him out. So the process was quick, so I didn't think it was so serious. But what did I know? Nothing. I was about to learn. About 11 months later, my brother went to court and he opted for a jury trial. Hmm. The trial only lasted a couple of hours. Really? Oh, crap. And the jury found him guilty of a sexual encounter with a minor. Do you know what the minimum sentence is? It's life. Wow. My brother was sentenced to life in prison. It took my breath away. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't imagine what could be going through his mind. I couldn't imagine what it would be like to be given life in prison. Could you? That was the day that I lost my brother, and that's the day that changed my life. That's the day that I joined millions of other people affected by incarceration in the United States. In 1997, there was a little over a million people in prisons. And today, it's doubled. There's over two million people in the prison system. Even though the United States only has 5% of the world population, we have over 20% of the incarcerated population. When my brother went to prison, I became outcarcerated. And I went into a self-imposed prison. I didn't know who to talk to or what questions to ask. And back then, people didn't talk about incarceration openly. Then and now it's a hidden sentence for family members. And I was full of shame and guilt. Every time I thought about my brother, I would get upset. And I'd cry at the most inopportune moments. And I felt guilty. How could I be having this great life while my brother's sitting in a prison cell? And I stuffed my feelings with alcohol and food instead of dealing with my feelings. Every letter that I received, every letter that I wrote, every collect call that I received would bring me down. But I never let my brother know. I was increasing my capacity for compassion, but I wasn't receiving any compassion. Not from my brother, not even from myself. And why? Because I didn't know how to ask for support. 
If I had opened up and asked for support, I would have received compassion. I hated going to the prison, but I knew that that was the only contact that my brother would have with somebody that loved him. And I could visit him on Saturdays and Sundays. And Saturdays were good because I knew that I would see him again on Sunday. But Sundays were hard because I didn't know when I'd see him again. He was incarcerated 3,000 miles away from where I lived. And it wasn't until that last time that I knew that he was going to serve his life sentence. My brother told me many things over the 15 years that he was incarcerated. He would talk about the problems that he had in the prison. He would talk about his dandruff, his back would hurt from the bed. And he told me that he had hepatitis C. And that was in passing, and I didn't realize that that was terminal. And it wasn't until that day my husband and I were sitting in the waiting room, waiting for my brother to walk in. And when he came in, he was in a wheelchair. He was being pushed in by another room inmate, and he was on oxygen, and there was an oxygen tank hanging off the back of the wheelchair. His stomach was protruding, and he was jaundiced, and he was shriveled up like an old man. He looked like Yoda. He was only 47 years old. I was strong that day, and I didn't cry. He lasted about an hour talking to us, and we did get to hear his last wishes. And after he left, I was sad, but I was also mad. Why didn't he tell me that he was sick? Why didn't he tell me that he was going through this? Why didn't he tell me that he was in the infirmary? I spoke to him every week, and I didn't know. And I also wondered if the, if he was on the outside, if this would have happened. Or if I knew sooner, if there was anything I could do. I did make arrangements with the assistant warden to come visit the following week. But on Tuesday, after the visit, I received a call from the assistant warden. And he told me that my brother had passed. And I was really grateful that I got to spend that time with him. He did serve his life sentence. Mm. Mm. And when I told people that my brother passed, they were surprised. They didn't know that I had a brother. Of course not. I didn't talk about it. And I didn't tell them that he died in prison. I went through the grieving process many times. Once when my brother was incarcerated, once when he passed away, and every time I went to visit him and leave, it was like a mini grieving process. If I had learned that all I had to do was talk to people to receive compassion, that it didn't have to take my brother going to prison and dying for me to ask for support, that I would have received the compassion that I needed. So I pose this question to you. Would you like to see more compassion in the world? Absolutely, yes. How about starting with yourself? Yeah, absolutely. Is there something that you're keeping hidden? I invite you to open up and have a conversation. Let's have conversations instead of shame. Find somebody to speak to. A safe person, a safe friend, a safe group and talk about it, talk about it, talk about it, whatever it is. It'll make your journey easier and open up the doorway to your capacity for compassion. And it may open the door for somebody else. Imagine a more compassionate world. It's easy if you try. Imagine that your visits are happier and easier and less stressful. My friend Doug, 
He's a professor at Iowa State University, and he was a part of a team that did a happiness study. And what they did was they had students go around and wish well thoughts, happiness, compassion to other people, not verbally, subliminally, they would just think it. I wish you well, just coming from their heart. And what they found when the students came back was that the students were happier. They felt more connected to other people and they felt less anxious. Imagine if we can use this tool. Let's imagine. I invite you to close your eyes if you want and imagine going to the prison and getting to the gate. Bing. Meeting the guard there and sending the guard a good wish, wishing them well. And then going through the metal detector and then being taken by a guard of the same gender into the room to be patted down. But you're wishing them good thoughts. You're wishing them well. And even though they're making you pull out your bra and rustle your hair and take your shoes off, you're not as rustled as you normally would be. You're calmer. And as you're escorted down the hall, you're still wishing the guard well. And the door opens, that metal door, and then the loud clank with that steel to steel. But it doesn't bother you as much this time. You walk into the waiting room and you take your seat and you see the guards at their table and you wish them well. You send them good thoughts. And then your loved one comes in and you go to hug him if you're allowed to hug. And you send him good thoughts. You wish him well. And you have a nice visit. And then when he leaves, you give him another hug and you send him good wishes. And you know that he's going to have a good day. You tell the guard that you're ready to leave and as the guard escorts you out, you're wishing him good wishes. And as you get to the final door, he says, I hope you had a good visit. And you look at him and you're like, this works. This really works. I invite you to open your eyes if they're closed. Let's take a deep breath. Let's breathe in compassion. And breathe out happiness to everybody here. Let's breathe in happiness and breathe out compassion to everybody here. I used to tell my brother that the only person he could be responsible for is himself. He couldn't change the guards, he couldn't change the inmates, but he could change the way that he reacted to other people. If I knew about this tool back then, I would have shared it with him. I think it would have helped his stay and also made our visits easier. So people might not know what we've been through and we might not know what they've been through. However, if we try to understand each other and walk in each other's shoes, we can have empathy for each other. And this is how we're going to close the empathy gap. It starts with you. You can use these tools as you go through the conference. Wish people well. Send a good thought. Send them a compassionate thought. And you are going to be blown away what you receive in the next couple days. Be open to it and enjoy the conference. Thank you.